children we have diseases because of uh, genetic problems or because of environmental problems and uh, some of the diseases are combination of both of them and it is very important to know how the disease is caused because of genetics and we have our expert dr s j patil from narayana health city he is a consultant in genetics has extensive experience in this field and we are grateful to him for having accepted this uh, uh, accepted to talk on this podium and i request dr s j patil to start his deliberation so that we could learn something from the uh, talk and take it home for use in our clinical practice of medicine uh, may i request dr s j patil to start his talk please dr s j patil thank you sir for that uh, kind introduction um just uh, share my screen so you can share your screen if you have a ppt yes now you are able to uh, see the slide good sir you are good sir we can see you sir just make it uh... is it okay yeah, now go ahead sir please sir perfect perfect okay Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm here to talk about uh, indications of genetic testing in clinical practice. Uh, with uh, uh, what goes into pre-test and post-test uh, counseling when we order a genetic test. Now, uh, genetic tests are no more uh, just a research test, nor they are luxury. I mean, they are affordable now. and uh, they play a very important role in the patient care and the uh, applications of these genetic test is increasing um, day by day uh, you know uh, due to mainly due to rapid advancement in the genetic test and therapies as well especially the next generation sequencing uh, so the these newer genetic tests especially the next uh, next generation sequencing based genetic tests are available now uh, both on research basis and commercial basis uh, and they are uh, their cost is decreasing and they are made easy to interpret although there are some cautious test uh, steps to be taken uh, while doing the interpretation of these uh, results of these next generation next generation sequencing tests and of course they have now uh, the turnaround time for these tests is Uh, less than uh, four weeks. Uh, to define what is genetic test, so genetic test is defined as any analysis of human DNA, RNA, chromosomes, uh, proteins, and metabolites. That is biochemical analysis in order to identify the hereditary nature of the disease in terms of genotypes mutations phenotypes karyotypes for the clinical purpose we call them as genetic test now uh, why and what we should know about genetic test before ordering a test when we suspect a genetic disorder in the family the question arises should i do the genetic test if yes what is the clinical utility what is the use uh, what is the use for the proband and for the family and then comes next step comes how to pick up a suitable genetic test uh, for a given situation there are arrays of tests available starting from basic karyotype fluorescent in situ hybridization that is fish mlpa uh, dna based targeted test uh, next generation sequencing chromosome microarray so once we know which test is suitable then we should understand what is the implication of the test results either it is positive or negative on the proband and the extended family members and the community as a whole and then comes once you select the test once you know what what are the implications of positive and negative results then you have to understand the cost turnaround time sensitivity specificity that is does the negative results rule out the diagnosis entirely if the result says positive does the result uh, mean that particular mutation or abnormality you have found out in the genetic results is really pathogenic really causing the disease what does the variant of unknown significance means so all these need, uh, things uh, need to be uh, taken into account once you order the test 
and also understand ethical, social, legal issues surrounding the genetic test. Once you understand all these things, then pre-test and post-test genetic counseling becomes easy and, and we know what should go into uh, the pre-test and post-test genetic counseling. Now, these are the list of genetic tests. Um, that is the cytogenetics. We have routine karyotype, FISH, MLPA, chromosomal microarray. In the molecular, we have targeted uh, mutation analysis that is specific mutation for a specific disease. Sequencing of the single genes. Uh, then comes the uh, next generation sequencing where we analyze many genes uh, parallelly. Uh, which might be a panel, whole exome, or whole genome sequencing. Then we have a biochemical analysis. Uh, as we go down here, the cost increases, and we have to be cautious, uh, cautiously using these advanced tests with proper interpretation. And today, I'll be focusing on indication of cytogenetics as well as molecular uh, genetic test. Now, the... the uh, Genetic tests are broadly classified based on their use in the genetic clinic, whether it is used for diagnostics, prenatal, to provide reproductive options, pre-implantation genetic screening, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, newborn screening, carrier testing, pre-symptomatic predictive testing, pharmacogenetics, predisposition, susceptibility testing, and the last is the research testing. So I would be mainly focusing on, 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 on the uh, use of uh, diagnostics and uh, some of the um, therapeutic and prenatal testing. And the clinical testing doesn't include direct-to-consumer testing and elective genome testing. Now, to begin with, uh, indication for chromosomal disorders. Uh, the chromosome should be done in any, any child with uh, or an adult with congenital malformation, child with obvious known uh, chromosomal disorders like Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Klinefelter syndrome, um, and then child with unexplained intellectual disability, developmental delay with or without malformations, be it a minor or major malformations, then you should do chromosomal analysis. Then disorders of sexual developmental DSD, a child with ambiguous genitalia, Autism spectrum disorders in, ob in obstetric practice coupled with recurrent spontaneous abortion, male infertility and female infertility. And then it is indicated in parents of children with unbalanced uh, chromosomal rearrangements and extended family member screening in families with familial balanced chromosomal rearrangements. And of course, you do it in malignancy uh, to diagnose, prognosticate, and management, which I will not uh, deal with these uh, chromosomal analysis in the mal malignant disorders. Then prenatal chromosome analysis is indicated in any fetus diagnosed with um, single malformation or multiple malformation. Then fetus with high risk for aneuploidy uh, in situations like advanced maternal age, uh, positive for aneuploid screening test using maternal serum, uh, serum screening tests and NIP. And of course, parent with balanced chromo chromosomal rearrangements where the child is at risk of having unbalanced chromosomes. So uh, now I'll be discussing some of the clinical scenarios and how to use chromosomes in different clinical scenarios and pre-test and post-test genetic counseling issues. Um, in obvious uh, common trisomies where we have uh, aneuploidies like um, uh, Down yeah. syndrome, trisomy 13, trisomy 18, that is Patav and Edwards syndrome. Here the clinical diagnosis is obvious, you know. Yeah. The, directly we can do in these cases only basic karyotype is indicated. As you can see here, the karyotype shows trisomy 21, trisomy 18, and here it is trisomy yes, 13. So, um, then so, um, the clinical diagnosis the solution arises uh, why uh, one should do the chromosome analysis. Sometimes the karyotype might be translocation type. So in order to provide risk of recurrence, as this translocation type can be inherited from one of the parent, the risk of recurrence increases. Whereas in uh, regular trisomies, that is uh, 
uh, in these uh, non translocation uh, trisomies the risk of recurrence will be low and increases with advanced maternal age and of course sometimes the karyotype will be useful in atypical cases to confirm the diagnosis like in mosaic cases or in the newborns it sometimes it becomes difficult for a routine pediatrician to pick up the down syndrome the karyotype helps in the confirmation of clinical diagnosis so this is another family uh, we uh, we had seen with congenital heart disease developmental delay as you can see here facial dysmorphism umbilical hernia increased circumferential folds with developmental delay and various other minor malformations when we uh, took the family history the mother gave a history of recurrent abortions there were six recurrent spontaneous abortion followed by live birth of a child with congenital malformations and developmental delay so when we did the basic karyotype the child showed the extra chromosome material attached to chromosome number 18 now we didn't know the origin as we understand that any structural rearrangement which we see in the chromosomes might be inherited from from one of the parent due to translocation so when we did the parental trans uh, chromosome analysis mother had a balanced chromosomal rearrangement between 4 and 8 and this balanced chromosomal rearrangement which is associated with normal phenotype has been inherited to the child in an unbalanced way resulting in the abnormal phenotype so this gives a diagnosis of partial trisomy 18 and partial monosomy 4 for this child suggesting that this is due to maternal balanced chromosomal translocation this mother parents were counseled regarding why this has happened uh, and what is what is the prognosis based on the uh, chromosomal imbalance and also regarding the risk of recurrence she will be again at risk of having unbalanced uh, chromosomal rearrangements in the future pregnancies the options would be either she can try naturally otherwise she can go for ivf Uh, pregnancies along with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and screening of the chromosomes so that normal embryo can be given for uh, implantation so coming to the next group of chromosomal disorders uh, that is micro deletions and micro duplications where sometimes the routine karyotype will not be able to pick up small deletions and small duplications which are less than 2 to 4 mb size so such uh, small deletions and duplications of less than 2 to 4 mb size are called as micro deletions and micro de duplications which cannot be picked up by uh, routine karyotype so uh, for these uh, uh, micro deletions and micro duplications we have to use the specialized test called as fish melpa that is the targeted test and also we can use chromosome microarray so clinically these micro deletions and micro duplications they present with multi system involvement intellectual disability learning difficulties and most of them have characteristic facial dysmorphisms gives an important clue along with the physical physical finding so this is a child who was operated at one year for submucosal cleft palate and later on presented with congenital heart disease that is tetralogy of fallot she has a characteristic facial dysmorphism in the form of puffy eyes upslant eyes bulbous nose and small mouth along with she has a slender fingers and you can see here a polydactyly this is again a child with truncus arteriosus and cleft palate and you can see the appears so <clears throat> this is very characteristic facial uh, appearance of de george bellocardio facial syndrome earlier known with many other names now we call them collectively as de george bellocardio facial syndrome and these uh, children are due to 22q micro deletion So to diagnose de george syndrome which is due to 22q micro deletion we use either fish or mlpa this is the fish picture showing a deletion here as you can see the control chromosome 
showing the pink and uh, green signal, whereas here it is the only control signal which is seen. And also the peak which is given by MLPA is half of the control peak which is red in color. So when the peak is half, half in size, then we know that there is a deletion in one of the chromosomes, giving the diagnosis of DeGeorge syndrome or velocardiofacial syndrome. So this is how we do the fish. Uh, we take a labeled uh, probe and hybridize it to the particular chromosome where we want to uh, check the deletion. An absence of one of the signal indicates that this particular chromosome has deleted this particular region of the chromosomes. So these are the unique sequence probes used for particular chromosomes. So prior knowledge of clinical phenotype is very, very important. If you don't know the clinical phenotype, that is, this uh, child is having 22Q deletion, 7Q deletion, 1Q deletion. We can't use force. So prior knowledge of clinical phenotype is very important whenever we use targeted MLPA or FISH. Now the next uh, the test in uh, the, uh, chromosomal uh, disorders is the chromosomal microarray. Unlike FISH and MLPA, we have to have a prior knowledge of clinical phenotype. Here we don't need the clinical phenotype. We can do uh, deletion and duplication, small deletions, that is micro deletions and micro duplications can be screened throughout the genome in this chromosomal microarray. And here the resolution is very high. The small deletions and duplications which are not um, identified through uh, uh, routine karyotype, we can identify by chromosome microarray. What are the indications of chromosome microarray? Here, whenever there is no obvious phenotype, when the child has got many overlapping phenotypes of say, uh, chromosome 10p deletion, 22q deletion, sometimes there are overlapping phenotypes, sometimes you don't know what it is. So patient with multiple congenital anomalies, not specific to a well-delineated uh, genetic syndrome, with or without developmental delay or an unexplained uh, developmental delay and intellectual disability, we need to do chromosomal microarray or in also autism spectrum disorders, first tire test is chromosomal microarray or any fetus with structural malformations, stillbirths, child with isolated birth defects like congenital heart, heart disease, you need chromosomal microarray. Sometimes with monogenic uh, disorders with severe phenotype, additional atypical findings or more than one monogenic conditions in an individual is suggestive of multiple genes are deleted, that is micro deletions or micro duplication, then chromosomal microarray is indicated. So this is a child uh, with congenital heart disease and some minor malformations with global uh, developmental delay and lot of behavioral problems with characteristic facial dysmorphism in the form of flat facial profile, epicanthic folds. He has this dented upper lip, short philtrum, and the karyotype was absolutely normal. So when we did the chromosome microarray, it showed 17p deletions, giving the diagnosis of uh, which was an heterozygous deletion, giving a diagnosis of smith magnus syndrome. So deletion is very small, 2.8 MB size. It cannot be picked up by uh, routine karyotype. So we need to do chromosome microarray, which is showing here the deletion of the chromosome 17P11.2 cytobank. This is another child, a seven month old, uh, referred to genetic clinic uh, for the evaluation of uh, large head size and abnormal neuroimaging finding in the form of dysgenesis and hypoplasia of corpus callosum and left cerebellum. So uh, this child uh, routine karyotype was normal, but facial dysmorphism was very obvious. You can see here there is a facial asymmetry the forehead is high and broad. There is a bitemporal narrowing. The eyebrows are straight and neat. There is a uh, nophris here. The, the eyebrows are joined in the midline and uh, up, up eyes, short filtrum. So these are the various um, 
facial dysmorphic features when we did the microarray we found duplication which is uh, of 1.4 mb size 7q11.23 cytoband so suggestive of 7q duplication syndrome the same region when it is deleted causes william syndrome whereas when it is duplicated it causes 7q duplication syndrome so hence uh, we got the diagnosis using microarray most of the children are having under, uh, intellectual disability autism microcephaly um, and um, uh, many other internal organ malformation sometimes it is uh, it can come from one of the parent here the, it was inherited from the father father had <clears throat> low penetrance he had only d grade speech vsd it was closed by itself by rcc prolapse and he was a school dropout so this is showing 7q duplication diagnosed with fish duplications are a bit difficult uh, to diagnose with fish so mlp is commonly used as you can see half the peak size the uh, of the normal whereas the blue is the patient one the peak size is more unlike deletion here the peak size is more suggestive of duplication so these are the various children uh, with chromosomal disorders sometimes it is very difficult to uh, you know pick up which to uh, which um, test we should go for either karyotype microarray especially in indian scenario where cost is a major factor most of the patient doesn't have insurance so the best is to uh, do karyotype where, where, where there is dysmorphic features are very severe and more minor minor malformations are there then best is to do karyotype and look for chromosomal abnormality or when the um, facial features are very obvious like down syndrome or patau syndrome and whenever there is subtle dysmorphism if the dysmorphism is subtle if the facial features are suggestive of 4p deletion or 22q or williams then do fish if you are not very sure facial dysmorphism is little bit subtle best is to go for chromosomal microarray so to conclude in chromosomal disorders use of molecular cytogenetics increases the diagnostic yield by 10 to 30% and um, uh, it should be used in unexplained developmental delay in intellectual disability facial dysmorphism multiple congenital anomalies as well as stillbirths one should remember there are many overlapping phenotypes and uh, one should take into account of clinical variability even in uh, chromosomal disorders like de george williams syndrome so adjunct chromo standard chromosome should always be done because some of the structural chromosome can come from one of the parents which gives an important clue uh, that this particular um, micro deletions or duplications can come from one of the parent hence can be useful in post test genetic counseling especially the risk of recurrence and reproductive options and mosaics can only be picked up if the, uh, the number of cells carrying the abnormal uh, phenotype uh, is 5 to 10% and partial aneuploidy it is 10 to 20% otherwise it is very difficult to pick up mosaic chromosomal abnormalities by uh, chromosomal microarrays best is to do routine karyotype in addition microarray can give uh, the knowledge about upd and uh, the uh, consanguinity uh, the loss of heterozygosity which gives an important clue for imprinting gene disorders and recessive genes so this this is just an overview uh, where the standard uh, chromosome should be used where uh, targeted test should be used where the microarray should be used then standard chromosomes should be ideally be used in recurrent spontaneous abortion and infertilities or whenever there is known obvious syndromes like down syndrome whereas fish or mlpa is used whenever you suspect a small deletions or duplication less than 4 mb size when that phenotype is very well characterized when the phenotype is not very well characterized when there is a lot of overlapping phenotypes then you use microarrays So these are the two children 
of different clinical phenotype, but same underlying cause. This child presented with a history of febrile seizures from one year of age, recurrent seizures treated with anti-epileptic drugs. At age eight years, he presented a history of uh, focal seizures to us with uh, recurrent ear infections and poor scholastic performance. Investigations revealed hypocalcemia, intracranial calcifications, and cardiac echo was normal. Basically, it was a feature of uh, clinical presentation was hypoparathyroidism. But as this child presented with congenital heart disease and developmental delay and very characteristic facial dysmorphism, bulbous nose, small mouth, upslant eyes, and craniosynostosis. And uh, his routine karyotype was normal. So here the facial features are very obvious and suggestive of 22Q microdeletion. As here, the facial features are very subtle. So both are cases of 22Q microdeletions which can be diagnosed using Whenever there are characteristic features, when you're sure, then use FISH or MLPA to diagnose this particular microdeletion. If you're not sure, uh, you can uh, do proposable micro. So these two cases indicates a uh, lot of uh, vi clinical variability. And this uh, case was supplemented with calcium and seizures reduced and uh, uh, the anti epileptic drugs were tapered off. So that was about chromosomal disorders. Now coming to single gene disorders. Single gene disorders can be Mendelian or non-Mendelian and they could be of nuclear origin or mitochondrial origin. So single gene disorders in Mendelian disorders uh, based on the pattern of inheritance, they could be autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, X-linked recessive and dominant. The single gene disorders can be suspected whenever there is single system involvement, say like a plastic anemia, hemophilia, where the child presents with anemia or recurrent episodes of pain, or cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or dilated cardiomyopathy, one should suspect single gene disorder. Or sometimes single gene disorder can even present with multi-system involvement. Say, for example, Noonan syndrome, and which is a single gene disorder. Uh, presenting with short stature, developmental delay, sometimes intellectual disability, and congenital heart disease. Or sometimes the single gene disorders even can present with multiple malformations. Here it becomes more challenging it to be differentiated from chromosomal disorders. Like Fanconi anemia can present with multiple malformations syndrome, old Durham syndrome. All these are single gene disorders. And based on particular ethnicity and background consanguinity, they can give an important, and these are the important clue that given disorder can be a single gene disorder. One should remember in single gene disorder, again, phenocopies, single, one gene can give rise to multiple phenotypes. Multiple phenotypes can be caused by single genes. So that we should remember which is called as clinical and genetic heterogeneity. Of course, one should know about clinical variability, penetrance, and modifier genes, and, and modifying environmental factors. So how to diagnose and how to pick up the DNA test uh, uh, to diagnose these single gene disorders? So DNA tests are essentially uh, PCR-based all of them are polymerase chain reaction, that is PCR-based tests. Either they can be targeted tests or single gene sequencing, or it could be many gene sequencing or all gene sequencing in whole exome and whole genome sequence. So in all these uh, DNA-based tests, we are identifying the mutation, that is the change in the single gene. Either it could be point mutation, that is missense, nonsense, frame shift mutations in the particular gene, or small insertions and deletions, or large deletions and duplication in a single gene. So DNA-based tests are to identify the mutation in the particular gene what we are thinking. Either it could be point mutations, small insertion deletions, or large deletions duplications involving a particular gene. Now coming to 
targeted gene test so targeted gene tests are done when we when we are sure about the clinical diagnosis like achondroplasia sickle cell anemia spinal muscular atrophy beta thalassemia major duchenne muscular dystrophy they are all single gene disorder where the mutations are specific for these diseases for example achondroplasia is caused by one mutation worldwide so by doing the targeted mutation same similarly sickle cell anemia only one mutation is known to cause these diseases so by doing those particular mutation screening we can diagnose all uh, cases of achondroplasia and sickle cell anemia similarly spinal muscular atrophy is caused by deletion of smn1 gene so by screening that particular deletion you can identify and diagnose sma similarly beta thalassemia major there are few common mutations which are in particular population which causes beta thalassemia major so by sequencing the particular gene you can diagnose uh, thalassemia major and also similarly duchenne muscular dystrophy where deletions and duplication account for 70% of the cases by doing targeted test we can diagnose duchenne muscular dystrophy so as i said in achondroplasia it is a clinical diagnosis and this particular mutation in the fgfr3 gene that is at this particular nucleotide position that is 1138 this accounts for 99% of the cases so targeted test pcr based sanger sequencing or rflp will give the diagnosis simple test similarly sickle cell anemia hemoglobin electrophoresis will give the diagnosis there is targeted dna test in various uh, hemoglobin disorders or hemoglobinopathies it helps in especially uh, for offering prenatal diagnosis and and diagnosis of atypical cases so this is the pcr rflp used for diagnosis of uh, uh, to identify mutation in the fgfr3 in cases with achondroplasia as you can see here this is a uh a uh, gel electrophoresis showing the positive mutation for that uh, particular case and sanger sequencing showing heterozygous mutation that is 1138 g2a so this is the heterozygous as you can see the both the graphs green as well as black so green represents a and g represents black so there is a g2a mutation here similarly in the beta thalassemia again the targeted uh, gene sequencing is done so diagnosis is achieved by hemoglobin electrophoresis dna test is mainly required for prenatal diagnosis and uh, 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 the atypical case in children in a child with sma which is an autosomal recessive disorder the incidence is 1 in 10000 and carrier frequency in the general population is high as 1 in 40 to 1 in 60 and it is caused by deletion of smn1 gene so here the dna test uh, done is the targeted test that is the look for deletion of smn gene homozygous deletion of smn1 gene so this is useful here in the confirming diagnosis unlike in achondroplasia and prenatal diagnosis the uh, the diagnosis achieved by clinically in achondroplasia as well as in by hemoglobin electrophoresis in beta thalassemia but here there are many differential diagnosis for floppy infant so confirmation of diagnosis is important by dna based test and also dna will give the number of smn2 copy which can predict predict the type of sma whether it is type 1 type 2 or type 3. and also it is very very useful in carrier detection and prenatal diagnosis so we do mlpa for deletion that is multiple ligation dependent probe amplification where each exon will give particular peaks as you can see here this blue peak is absent indicating homozygous deletion of smn1 gene the peak is half then it indicates carrier for this particular smn1 gene 
So this is another child, uh, one year, two months, born to a consanguineous parent, presented with large head and mild developmental delay. MRI brain outside reported as Canavan's disease. We did repeated urine GCMS, which was negative for this particular biochemical, uh, particular metabolite. And when follow up, when we did the repeat in a MRI, um, there was subcortical cyst seen. As you can see here, subcortical temporal cyst, giving a diagnosis of megalencephaly leukoencephalopathy, also called as Van der Nupp syndrome. It is an autosomal recessive disorder. And we did particular this uh, gene sequencing toward homozygous mutations. So hence, we uh, did the counseling for the, uh, for the family and offered prenatal diagnosis. The risk of recurrence given was 25% as it is autosomal recessive disorder. And the fetus was unaffected. This is another child who presented with, uh, with uh, multiple joint contractors, facial dysmorphism, and the spooning of the tongue. So joint contractors were involving both upper limb and lower limb. In addition, she has submucosal cleft palate and motor developmental delay. Her cognitive functions were absolutely normal. So first, younger males had died at the age of uh, five days with multiple joint contractures. So this gave a clinical diagnosis of distal arthrogryposis. Now, most of the distal arthrogryposis are autosomal uh, dominant, whereas here we thought of autosomal recessive inheritance. This is the skeletal picture showing mild scoliosis along with joint contract in the finger. And she has eusotropia along with albinotic fundi. We know that this is called this autosomal recessive type 5D. Resemble which this case classically fits into type 5D, autosomal recessive form, and the gene was ECEL1 gene. And when we sequenced it, we found homozygous exon 14 gene, hence confirming the diagnosis. So accordingly, patients were counseled. So the other important aspect when we uh, see the DNA report, when we see that, that the given uh, gene has got particular mutation, it is very important to understand that whether it is in the coding region or in the non-coding region. Generally, the mutations in the non-coding region are non-pathogenic. They doesn't cause any harm. But in the, in the coding region, that is in the exons, they are harmful. But sometimes they can be a common polymorphisms. Then how to go if it is a novel mutation, if it is not reported in the literature to cause a disease, then how to go about whenever we find a novel mutation even in the coding region. So to understand its pathogenicity, we have to do functional analysis using computer tools or by using animal models. For example, in this case, we do functional analysis in silico using computer tools. And we found that this particular region, exon 14, is conserved in all the uh, homologs, that is, in different animals. And also, by using homology for model, we found that this particular mutation in exon 14 is located near the zinc finding pocket, characterized by, by these. Uh, protein molecules and this disrupt the binding of the zinc by these residues, indicating that this mutation is pathogenic. And also further, we did validation by doing parental uh, segregation. Parents were carriers, they were asymptomatic, and we also screened these particular mutations in the healthy controls, which was not seen and also in the databases it was not seen and also we used different um, software programs uh, showing that this particular uh, mutation in distal arthroviposis type 5d that is in the ecel1 gene was damaging with different tools available predicted to be damaging so either we use uh, in silico that is computer tools to analyze these mutations, whether it is pathogenic or not, or sometimes when it is a new gene, then we use animal models like zebra fish and mice models. So that's the confirmation of distal arthrogryposis type 5D using targeted ECEL1 gene sequencing. 
Uh, coming to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, it is a highly heterogeneous disorder um, uh, seen in both uh, children and adults. Uh, and the clinical features range from uh, symptomatic to syncopal attacks or signs and symptoms related to left ventricular outflow obstruction in the form of cardiac failure, sudden death, usually seen in young adults and adolescents. There are many genes. Treatable causes are Pompe's disease and Fabry's disease. Here we do panel testing. Those who are negative on panels, they are taken for whole exome sequencing. Both are done by uh, using next generation sequencing. So the next generation sequencing uh, is a multiple genes which are sequenced parallelly, uh, simultaneously. And these are used wherever uh, the genetic conditions are associated with high genetic heterogeneity is multiple genes causing the particular phenotype. For example, in cardiomyopathy, there are 50 to 70 genes are known to cause cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic ones. Arrhythmia uh, are caused by 10 to 30 genes. Intellectual disability and autism are caused by 30 to 50 genes. Clinically, sometimes it is it becomes very difficult to differentiate each gene. So then you use multiple panel genes or whole exome genes, which has less turnaround time to identify underlying genetic So this is in just, I'll not go into the detail of uh, the uh, analysis of how we concluded that which gene is the cause, but just to indicate that variable uh, variability even among the family members, like this uh, was an 80 year old uh, grandmother of this child who had undergone surgery for LVOT. She was also having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but her symptom and the father was having just easy fatigability and increased sweating. Otherwise, he was asymptomatic. So, indicates intrafamilial variability and the gene NGS panel for uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy showed two genes. So, things become complicated because of two genes to identify which gene is causing, how to use it in clinical phenotype. So, a lot of pre-test and post-test counseling do functional analysis, review of literature, all these things need to be done whenever you order and uh, get the results of genetic uh, testing. So the clinical utility of genetic testing in cardiomyopathy uh, uh, is for prognosis, for lower therapy and extended family screening. And this becomes complicated by penetrance, clinical variability, variant of unknown significance and negative results. Sometimes uh, the mutations might be highly pathogenic and this may have an impact on the management in cases with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy especially, such as to take a decision to offer an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So sometimes it is useful in the management, sometimes it is useful in the prognosis, but one should remember things are not that straightforward in some of the families. So one of the greatest drawbacks of genetic testing, especially in cardiomyopathy, is variant finding a uh, identification of variant of unknown significance. The other important treatable cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is is um, Pompe's disease. They present infantile form, present with floppiness, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, failure to thrive, and fe feeding difficulties. Here we have a treatment. Uh, that myozyme enzyme is given 20 milligram per kg once in two weeks intravenously lifelong. So I will share the uh, one of my uh, patient uh, details who is under treatment for the last six to seven years. This child was all right till four months, presented with um, failure to thrive, feeding difficulty, weak cry, paucity of limb movements, born to a consanguineous parents. Diagnosed to have a pulmonary tuberculosis at some uh, at seven months because of failure to thrive was put on AKT. At one year she had an uh, one year three months she had an aspiration pneumonia was ventilated and suspected to have cardiomyopathy. When when she came to us she was oxygen dependent on nasogastric tube feeds and uh, examination showed normal growth, growth parameters hypotonia microglossia and showing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
So there are many other metabolic causes which need to be considered in differential diagnosis, which can be ruled out. I'll not go into the details of these things. Uh, with the raised CPK, SGPT, SGOT, we did an enzyme analysis in the blood, alpha glucosidase, which was deficient in this child, hence giving the confirmation of complete disease. And the, of course, further it was confirmed by DNA mutation analysis, which showed homozygous mutation in the exon. And the child was started on myosin 20 milligram per kg. Then gradually she became oxygen free of nasogastric feeds. So there was motor developmental delay. On follow-up, she had a bilateral ankle contractures, which were treated with physiotherapy and orthotics. And she had some amount of speech delay. And also echocardiography gradually over a period of time, the mass index, as you can see, gradually improved so as the ejection fractures. Unfortunately, she didn't develop any antibodies. That is one of the major uh, limiting factors. In, uh, in treating these children with the ERT, as some of them can develop antibodies. So here the enzyme assay gives the confirmation of the diagnosis. DNA test is basically useful in atypical cases, wherever enzyme, we are not sure when the enzyme results are ambiguous, and especially useful in carrier detection and prenatal diagnosis. And sometimes it will help to predict status whether the particular child is going to develop antibodies or not if it is crim negative the most likely the child is going to antibodies uh, against the enzymes which are giving interim this is the video of a child who has been treated with um, enzyme replacement therapy without ERT most of the children die by one year of age infantile cases especially so she is on ERT since one year of age now she is around eight years Although there is some amount of proximal muscle weakness in the lower limb, upper limb are absolutely fine. She is going to school, studying well, is absolutely fine. And she is able to do her activities daily, I mean, taking bath, going toilet, cleaning, everything she does by, her, uh, by herself. So coming to the last uh, uh, case, uh, which we had uh, this uh, adult was referred from uh, neurology, a 33-year-old old man, no other family members affected, born to non-consanguineous parents. Uh, he had uh, normal birth, normal developmental history, but had an involuntary movement, predominantly involving lips and face from three to five years of age. Now he is 33 year old, treated uh, as uh, seizures, psychogenic cause. Mm, he has gone from one doctor to another doctor with no help uh, and no uh, cure for his uh, illness. Uh, his general physical examination was essentially normal. I'll show the video. He has an involuntary movement Basically, we thought of frontal lobe epilepsy and paroxysmal dyskinesia in this uh, case. You can see here the uh, involuntary movements, basically nocturnal. They, they come in attacks uh, throughout the night, disturbing his quality of sleep, as you can see here. And he's fully aware of, of these episodes, which come and last for around... Uh, 10 to 15 minutes, around 10 to 30 episodes per night. And this is from, from the age of 5 years. So these are the various genes, multiple genes, uh, causing paroxysmal dyskinesia. So we did a whole exome sequencing, which showed ADCY5 gene mutation mosaic form as you can see the mutant read is 13 and wild type is 72 as you can see here the green and uh, brown g and a so both together showing that this mutation is in the mosaic form confirming the di diagnosis of adcy5 related 
familial dyskinesia with facial myogynia. So basically, this mutation causes gain of function. So normally, these uh, this particular uh, gene is uh, uh, inhibited by dopamine receptors, activated by adenosine receptors. So gain of function leads to excessive activation by these A2A receptors, resulting in increased cyclic AMP production, which causes neuronal fire firing, causing this particular involuntary movements. This enzyme is highly expressed, mainly highly expressed in the brain, mainly in the atom. So we know that ADCY5 is a gain of function which is causing the increased production of cyclic AMP. So interesting development which we got from the uh, this particular paper is caffeine will reduce the uh, production of cyclic AMP. So we used coffee as a treatment for him as reported in this particular family from the French group. So using a uh, daily coffee in the night and the morning reduced his involuntary movements almost by 70 to 80 percent further since he was uh, having some discomfort in using so much of coffee he used caffeine capsules which further reduced the involuntary movements by 90 to 95 percent so this was an interesting uh, uh, case because the simple coffee would cure all his involuntary movements and restore his quality of sleep. Um, this is, uh, sorry, this is the final case of prenatal diagnosis, how we used the genetic testing in prenatal testing. This child was referred, uh, fetus was referred with uh, desmorphic features, short limbs and hitchhiker thumb and cleft palate with uh, features suggestive of lethal skeletal dysplasia, that is, that is pondyly, short limbs, abnormal iliac bones. So we suspected diastrophic dysplasia related disorders where the initial Sanger sequencing of this gene causing diastrophic dysplasia was negative. Then we did whole exome sequencing where we found biallelic homozygous mutation in IMPAD1 gene, confirming the diagnosis of APP type of chondrodysplasia with joint dislocation. Hence, we counseled the family uh, that this disease is autosomal recessive disorder. Risk of recurrence is 25%. Prenatal diagnosis can be offered both by ultrasound and DNA. DNA will only help in early diagnosis as early as 12 weeks by chorionic villus sampling so that they can decide about the combination of pregnancy. So uh, finally, to conclude, pre-test and post-test counseling, uh, whenever you order a uh, test, should include explaining the hereditary nature of the disease, what are the importance of genetic testing, whether it is confirmation or using for uh, prognostication, and also one should explain the benefits and limitation of each test we order and consequence on the test on the probe band and for the extended family members. What are the implications of positive and negative results, cost, turnaround time? Of course, one should take the informed consents. Then coming to post-test counseling, it should include what, what, what should be done with the positive results and the negative results. Does negative results uh, rule out the diagnosis of a given condition 100% uh, or it requires a further genetic testing? What does the positive results mean? It means confirmation of diagnosis. It leads to anticipatory guidance. Therapeutic options are there as we have discussed how Pompe disease and that ADC by 5 gene mutations were used to treat the particular disorder. Of course, long-term follow-up, risk of recurrence, reproductive options, all these can be achieved with the positive, positive results. And of course, one should remember to refer all the patients uh, to the various specialities as most of them have multi-system involvement. So whenever you do genetic uh, counseling, 
even if the test is negative or positive there are many outcomes in terms of uh, uh, there can be positive outcomes negative outcomes or sometimes the results might be uncertain so whenever you have a positive test positive outcome part there is a relief removal of uncertainty for a family and they generally adopt to the particular situation and change their lifestyle for example removal of stressors in long qt syndrome they uh, you know adopt over a period of time to the particular situation so these are all uh, positive outcomes negative outcomes with the positive results are the family might go through emotional trauma anxiety guilt jealousy anger uh, employability uh, risk to the stream various other negative options so we have to deal with all these emotions whenever we handle the family with positive results and sometimes uncertainty will always be there even if the test is positive for example variable expressivity incomplete penetrance how aggressive should the follower be given the results are positive especially in the familial cancers and negative results also come with particular um, um, uh, with lot of positive and negative emotions positive is um, you know the, they are free from un uncertainty they know that the knowledge that tested mutation cannot be passed on to the children they are happy no need of any prophylactic screening or treatment if currently asymptomatic so these are the positive outcomes in the negative results sometimes the negative uh thing is possible uh, possibility of survival guilt will always be there whoever is tested negative in the family and uncertainty genetic cause can never be completely excluded especially when we take familial uh, dilated cardiomyopathy if the results are negative it doesn't mean that the dilated cardiomyopathy is not genetic it's, it can be still genetic this test had particularly not picked up the mutation if asymptomatic you can't rule out the other causes of heart disease that is that that's that uncertainty in the negative results will always be there of course one should remember social legal ethical issues surrounding these genetic tests which might as in social uh, causes uh, the social issues around the genetic testing might be stigmatization discrimination one should be sensitive enough for cultural and religious issues like abortion consanguinity various customs and beliefs legal issues uh, might be discrimination by insurance companies employment fetal sex discrimination symptomatic uh, testing should not be uh, done for minors if there are no benefits rights of privacy fraudulent promises treatments reassurance misled by the counselor might amount to legal notice and of course negligence failure to take family history not ordering appropriate tests sometimes might draw legal notice of course one should remember uh, ethical issues like justice non maleficence veracity fidelity that is all patient should be treated in the same way privacy uh, confidentiality should be taken care of so to conclude a uh, genetic testing clinical uh, practice um, whenever you order a genetic test in a suspected family one should understand why we are doing uh, what is the use that is the clinical utility and limitation of each test like micro deletions cannot be picked up by routine, routine karyotype or in a duchenne muscular dystrophy if the deletions are duplication by mlpa is negative it doesn't mean the child is not having duchenne muscular dystrophy still there are 30% of the cases which could be a point mutation in the in a particular case that will be picked up by next generation sequence so understanding limitation of each test will help the patient family uh, to undergo further testing if the results are negative so whenever we have difficulties uh, in 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 diagnosis or uh, to pick up a suitable test use diagnostic criteria or scoring system that are available for various disorders like marfan syndrome red syndrome which help us to diagnose a case and order a particular test so all the genetic test whatever chromosomal single gene disorders we should have an adequate pre test and post test on counseling along with uh, one should be sensitive about 
ethical, social, legal issues. So genetic testing in children uh, is not done unless there is a direct uh, health benefit. For example, hypothyroidism, phenylketonuria. It should not be done in children with no immediate medical benefits like endocarya, thalassemia screening should not be done in children. So pre-symptomatic testing children is not done unless there is a direct health benefit. Thank you. Thank you for the patience. Thank you, Dr. Patil, for that excellent uh, talk on um, basic genetics and genetic testing. It was very well done. It, you gave a comprehensive view. We dealt with hereditary nature of disease, how we classify genetic testing, what are the indications, what are the common uh, trisomies, what is micro deletion and micro duplication, and how is it done? What is uh, FISH? What are the standard methods, standard chromosome analysis, chromosome uh, microassay, and FISH tests? And uh, then there were some case, case scenarios. Um, mention about cardiomyopathy, especially hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and what are single gene disorders, and ultimately about the pre and post uh, test counseling, how this uh, helps in the uh, patient's life, given patient's uh, life. And if there are any questions, are there any questions there? Uh, if somebody wants to ask any question, please post it on the uh, chat box. Uh, to start the questionnaire, I will just would like to ask Dr. Patil, do you think uh, a genetic counseling and genetic uh, testing should be a part of uh, general health evaluation um, uh, in patients in future? Do you think it will become a part of the, suppose a person comes, he's apparently healthy, but he would like to know what is in store for him or her in future, especially with regard to diabetes, hypertension, renal disease, etc., cetera. Yes. Do you think it yes, is sir. going to become a standard practice? Yeah, uh, in multifactorial disorders like diabetes and uh, hypertension, coronary right. artery disease, right. uh, it is a susceptibility testing, sir. Mm. Right. Clinically, how much it is useful, um, still, uh, you know, many things are happening at research uh, settings sure. but yeah in in future uh, you know definitely they might be of use in making the uh, family understand their risk and right. in the western countries in some of the commercial labs are offering these things but uh, still in india it is not uh, offered routinely right. sometimes patient can go directly to the lab which is called as direct to consumer testing they want oh. to know their risk Yes. Sometimes they want to know, uh, uh, you know, uh, the risk of cancer, irrespective of family history. Correct. They yes. want to do it. So it is up to the patient, but it is ideally what recommendations are involve a clinician so that patient can uh, understand uh, the results properly in a proper way. Otherwise, what positive means, negative means, which will create a lot of uh, psychological issues. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So involving clinician is the best option so that patient chooses based on the information given. Thank you for that excellent reply. I would like to just highlight that we have done uh, a genome-wide polygenic score to integrate information from many of the common DNA variants into a single number with the help of the Medgenome, what they have done is they have taken a sample of about 7,000 uh, patients in South India, South Asia actually. Yes, sir. And they have looked into 6.6 .6 million common DNA variants. And they have, uh, we, actually, we, we are also part of that study. We have come up with a GPS, what they call as genome wide polygenic score which can quantify the inherited risk of coronary artery disease. Right, sir. So this is uh, 
this has been just published in the journal of american college of cardiology right sir so i, yeah, uh, I have gone through that article sir oh yeah, thank very you interesting. Yeah. Yes, very interesting yeah yes very interesting thank you for the excellent talk i'm just seeing if there if there any questions There's on the one question by kedar asking uh, can we do genetic test in antenatal period how do we take any desired sample from the fetus from the fetus okay that's a yeah. very good question yeah the genetic testing from the fetal uh, fetus is done either if the fetus has congenital anomaly right or high risk for aneuploid screening so in the in the two situations we do some sort of genetic testing based on the scenario for example if child has a uh, increased nuchal thickness absent nasal bone ultrasound showing these things first thing is we suspect down syndrome chromosomal disorders so we rule out chromosomal disorders if there are multiple malformations then best is to do microarray which will screen the whole uh, genome for micro deletions and micro duplication i hope this answered uh, your uh, yes yes i think so i think so and sample is uh, best is uh, for single gene disorder it is the cvs sample because we need lot of dna to do single gene analysis best is to take cvs sample at around 11 to 13 weeks ideally 12 weeks amniotic fluid is is meant for chromosomal disorders which is uh, the sample is taken between uh, 17 to 18 weeks okay but both can be used for either of uh, the disorder chromosomal or single gene right I don't see any more questions. I would like to thank you for the excellent talk. It was uh, lucid and clear. We are grateful to you for this talk and uh, I hope the participants have been benefited a lot. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. We'll meet you sometime thank once you, again, once again yeah. to give a similar talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anthony, can we close? Is there any question there in your box? No, sir. There is only one question, sir. That is answered, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is answered. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. So, so I would like to thank you and for and by for creating this opportunity. Thank it's you. A great so platform. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Mandi, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all.